Well, howdy there, folks. Welcome into today's video. First off, uh, my baby is sleeping, so I'm going to have to speak a little quieter in this video, so I do apologize. I want to apologize on behalf of needing to speak quietly in this video and also apologize on behalf of my beard and hair situation that I get picked on every single day for, okay? So I uh, just want to put that out front. So a few things we're going to talk about in this video. PayPal is first up here. I have some big uh, information regarding PayPal that I think was worth talking about in, from a few different angles here. After we get done talking about PayPal in this video, we're going to talk about small caps. They continue to roll heavy. It's catching a lot of people off guard who were not expecting this. We're going to talk about what's likely to transpire next. And then the third thing we're going to get into, the, the other main thing we're going to get into in this video, is they looked at data since 1950. And based upon how the market performed this past year, meaning 2023 plus what happened in 2022, there's only really like six other occurrences in history. Every single one of those occurrences meant the market was green the next year, meaning the market should be green in 2024. I'm going to show you the data behind that and uh, essentially should also show you like, is this going to be the first time ever we break that trend in 2024? And if the market is up, how much is it likely to be up during the year based upon the historical trend since 1950? Okay, so appreciate you guys joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for being subscribed to the channel. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into this, guys. I appreciate y'all being here as always, okay? So PayPal, obviously the stock has started to run, right? This is since around the end of October, the last week of October. Baby's climbed 25% and it's done pretty darn quickly. I mean, yeah, that's less than two month span there. And to climb 25%, that's a pretty uh, fast move there, okay? Now, look at this. This is something we haven't talked about probably since PayPal launched it, but no one's really heard anything about this. And a lot of people are starting to get intrigued, like, what's going on here? PayPal. It's time for an update on PayPal's PYUSD stablecoin as its market cap and volume have grown immensely. After the flurry of exchanges and partnerships announced at the end of November, there haven't been any large announcements. However, exchanges such as Bullish, not available in the U.S., have driven up volume immensely. The coin has a long way to go, but we see above five, a 5% 5 market cap uh, to volume routinely on weekdays, which is far better than the average stablecoin, excluding the top two, USDT, uh, right, and uh, USDC. So this kind of shows you the market uh, volume in the past 24 hours. Here are the market cap and circulating supply here, right? Uh, PayPal coin, we'll just call it that. I like call it PayPal coin, okay? PayPal coin still has a long ways to go to catch up to, obviously, USDT and uh, USDC, right? The big dogs, Tether and uh, USDC. But looking, it's looking like it's going to break the top 10. So right now it's at number 11. And yeah, it's probably going to break top 10. And I wouldn't be surprised if it breaks top 5 in 2024. Okay, so things are definitely on the right track as far as a stable coin overall. But in the last few days, in the last few days, the market cap has grown to 260 million. Again, this is small, but within striking range of top 10. Part of this increase, which isn't circulating just yet, hence the discrepancy, is Frax adopting PayPal coin to be in becoming the second largest holder of the coin overall. Hmm, very intriguing, very intriguing. So um, there's PayPal coin opportunity. It's, it's, I mean, I don't even ever talk about it because it's kind of like just a call option on PayPal. Like, like what if PayPal ends up having the uh, most widely adopted, let's call it stable coin in the world? Like, like how does that change the, the story for PayPal over the next five to 10 years? And especially if crypto gets much bigger over the next five, 10 years, which is a high probability. Yeah, like, you know, certainly I'm not the most bullish person uh, in the world on crypto. But with that being said, I, you know, if I had to make a bet, is, is crypto much more popular in five years or less popular? I'd say much more popular. Yeah. 10 years, much more popular. I don't think, you know, the popularity of crypto is going to get less. I think it's going to get more. And so if PayPal's in a position where they can have one of the biggest, or if, dare I say, they end up taking the market someday, right? Which that's going to take them years to likely reach that if they're ever going to get up there to like number one, number two position. Man, I, uh, you know, what does that do for the PayPal story, right? What does that do for the PayPal story? And I still haven't even figured that out. And I don't have this priced in any of my valuation models in regards to stock or anything like that. This, this, what I look at for this PayPal stablecoin opportunity, I look at it very similar to like how I would look at Tesla when it comes to 
uh, you know, self-driving vehicle in, the, in the, t the self-driving taxi network, right? Where it's like, wow, maybe that could be huge someday, but let's, let's see. Let's see what happens over the next few years, right? That's where I'm at with this, but there's good progress being made there. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a tremendous amount more progress made over this next one to two years in regards to this. And don't be surprised if you start hearing a lot more about the PayPal stablecoin over the next 12 to 24 months, folks. Okay. Now, something else very important I'm starting to see out there now at this point in time is I'm starting to see so many people starting to flip bullish on PayPal. I, I checked out this article here today. I was bearish on PayPal, but after a 77% decline, now I'm buying. This article just came out, I think, a couple hours ago. This gentleman going all into why he's uh, excited about PayPal, why he thinks it's going to do good. Uh, this article came out here today as well. PayPal operational challenges ahead, but exceptionally undervalued. Now, the interesting thing about this guy and what he has to say in regards to PayPal is he's looking at a little bit more for a short-term trade perspective of maybe the next year or so, right? And he's talking about holding it till $80 or so. So PayPal is starting to attract not only long-term investors like myself that are excited about PayPal's next three, five, seven years, but it's also starting to attract these folks that are looking at it as kind of like, man, this might be a great play for the next six to 12 months here. Ride that baby to $80 or $100 and then flip out of it because maybe those folks don't want to be in this story long term, right? There's a lot of different market participants trying to achieve different things in the market, right? I checked out Seeking Alpha and I want to say, like, what are, what are all the most recent articles in regards to stock? It's insane how bullish people are starting to get on PayPal just in the past one month. It was not like this in the past, but I can tell you the last one month, look at this, buy, strong buy, 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 strong buy, strong buy, 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 buy. People are starting to flip in mass on the retail side, right, for PayPal, which is very intriguing. But on top of that, we have something very interesting going here on here on the Wall Street side, right? So. First thing is no one has a seller strong sell on PayPal at this point in time, which shows you how much of a um, undervalued stock this is, that no one even feels comfortable slapping a seller strong sell rating on this anymore, which means you've likely definitely formed a bottom on this stock, right? Which is pretty clear in regards to the price action as well, right? But on top of that, we have a startlingly huge, I don't ever remember, ever, seeing 20 hold ratings on a stock in my life. That's insane. Like, I, I'm like, I can't even fathom that number. There's 20 analysts that have a hold ratio, uh, have a hold on PayPal. I mean, it's crazy. What happens when some of these hold people start flipping over the bullish side on Wall Street? I think that's going to be a very interesting time. To show you how startling this number is, let me show you the two most, like, followed stocks in the stock market, right? Apple and Microsoft. How many people have a hold on those stocks? So, in regards to Apple, 14 people have a hold on Apple, right? That's the giant that is Apple, which, by the way, Dan Ives says Apple's going to $4 trillion next year. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Mr. Softy, Microsoft, has five analysts that have a hold on it. And these are the most covered, most popular stocks out there, right? And not even they have anywhere remotely close to as many people. So this is just people, they're not bearish on the stock anymore, right? But they're not ready to flip bullish. So it's going to be interesting to see if Alex Chris pulls through numbers this year and the story and he starts to attract some of these analysts over this buy side, ooh, that's going to be intriguing to see what happens with the stock price. Now, one of the most common questions I get in regards to PayPal, right? Everybody knows I'm very bullish on PayPal. I've been starting to buy the stock very heavily the last, you know, three to six months here. And um, everybody knows that, right? But the question a lot of people are asking is, when am I going to sell this stock? And I said, let me address this question because I think it is an important question. When am I going to sell PayPal stock. So whenever I think about selling any stock in the market, the first thing I consider is, okay, when do I see this company's revenues or net incomes potentially topping, right? It's a very important question. In regards to PayPal, if I think about the revenue net income, I'll be honest with you guys, I, I don't see it anytime soon. If it does happen, it's so many years away, it's hard for me to even see. Like, I can't see any time anytime soon, the revenues going down or the net income going down. For the next several years, I just see their revenues continue to climb year after year after year, the net income climb year after year after year. I don't see it being any different between what I look at on the PayPal side, the Venmo side, which that's a huge monetization opportunity over this next several years. And then when I look at the Braintree side, which has growth for days, I, I don't see there being any way 
that this company doesn't grow revenues and net income substantially year after year after year for a long, long time to go in the future. So when when I have a stock like that, I can't even think about selling anytime soon. I mean, PayPal could go to 120. It could double from here. And I still wouldn't be selling it. Why wouldn't I be selling it? Let's say PayPal's 120 at this time next year. Why wouldn't I be selling it? The reason I would not be selling it is because I still likely would think the revenues and net incomes are going up dramatically more. So it wouldn't make sense for me to cash out shares. No, I don't know if you guys have seen my base case for PayPal stock over the next several years, but let me run you through those numbers, okay? So every, you know, with all my big positions, I always create like an ultra bearish case for that stock, bear case, base case, bull case, and ultra bullish case for the next five years for that stock, okay? So here's my base case for PayPal over the next several years, all right? So I have them doing about 8% revenue growth on average a year for the next several years and about 16% net income growth. They've, they've shown, if you look at their numbers in the past three, to three quarters or so, they're showing that they're growing their net income at a much faster clip than their revenues, which I don't think is a trend that's going to stop, and I think it's going to continue on. So looking at this here, I have the company getting to, you know, let's call it, if you, you have a 20 to 30 P, which I think will be very fair for the stock in 2027, you're looking at somewhere between about a 100, in, once again, share dilution, share buybacks, I can change some things, but these are rough numbers. A market capitalization between $144 billion and $217 billion on this company overall. If you want to pause the video to look more in depth at all my numbers there, you can certainly look more in depth. This is my base case. So my base case, I always think about it as my realistic scenario that I really see happening for the stock. So that means the stock's going to likely 2x to 3x um, by 2027, which, you know, I don't think I'm taking very much risk in PayPal stock. I don't. I do not think this is some stock, I, you know, I'm going to lose 50% of my money or more on. I, I don't see it being one of those potential stocks. There are some of those stocks out there, right? Um, this is not one of those where I'm like, dang, man, PayPal down to 30 bucks. I'm going to lose 50%. Eh, so unrealistic in my personal opinion, right? Now, I'm getting close to break even in my big dog count, the public count here. Getting very close to break even on this baby now at this point in time, which you know, the way I kind of see this stock, and I, I've told you guys this, I think it's going to be a mini-me meta. I really do. You, you know, there's so many growth vectors for PayPal. I mean, so many growth vectors all over. It reminds me so much of meta. Just, it's a year apart, right? Meta was, no one wanted a piece of meta last year. No one wanted a piece of PayPal this year, right? It's just a year apart in regards to these guys. So, I think this is going to be a mini-me situation in regards to PayPal. And, you know, a few, probably two to three years out, I'm going to be looking at maybe, I'm not going to be looking at this big of gains because I've put a lot more in Meta stock. But I wouldn't be surprised if I'm looking at like 150000 and maybe $250,000 in gains on the stock two to three years from now. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Let's just call it that. And so that's kind of my expectations there. Now, I thought this was really important. I've got to talk about this because so, not a lot of people understand math. <laughs> and I'm talking the most base level math, not like super complicated math, base level math, okay? And it shows you the power of compounding. And I think want everybody watching this video right now, this should wake you up and wake you up in a substantial way. Things are really starting to get fun with me in regards to meta stock now, okay? Check this out. This stock only went up 1.6% today, 1.6%. And I was up over $10,000 today on this stock. The numbers are starting to get so big because the stock has gone up so much that even a very small percentage up is now a lot of money, a lot of money. We call this phase the power of compounding, the power of compounding in your portfolio getting bigger, your stocks getting bigger, positions getting bigger, and as, especially once those positions go over a 100% gain, things start to get really fun. That's not the best of it, okay? Check this out. This is Elf Beauty, right? This stock was only up 3% today, three percentage points. And I was up $4,700 on that stock. My entire cost basis of all my shares is $7,200. So think about this now, right? All this stock needs to do is go up a few percentage and I basically make my entire cost basis back in one day. In one day. That's insane to think about, right? Never mind if Elf keeps running from here. It could, it could get to a point. Like, let's imagine Elf keeps rolling, and next thing you know, it's a $200 plus stock. It's going to get to the point where if Elf goes up like a percent in a day or 2% in a day, that it will be worth more in terms of my one-day gain than I paid for all of my shares combined. That's the power of compounding, folks. 
This is substantial. This is the fun part of investing, right? 2022, we got to see the brutal side of investing when all stocks are just getting decimated. This is the stage we call the fun part of investing, the power of compounding when your money is really working for you in a strong, strong way. By the way, last year was fun as well because last year we got a ton of deals to buy out there, a ton of deals, right? I remember, you know, this should kind of like shake your brain up a little bit in terms of like, oh my gosh, like (laughs) this is crazy, right? One of those moments for me was when I heard that Warren Buffett has some Coca-Cola shares that he makes almost basically based upon how much he makes in dividends, he can make almost as much as he paid for his shares. And he's got certain shares out there. This is phenomenal, okay? Warren Buffett makes, you know, let's call it almost $750 million a year in dividend income just from Coca-Cola. $750 million a year in just dividend income from Coca-Cola, right? Berkshire Hathaway's cost basis for its Coca-Cola shares is just $3.24. Based on its $1.84 per share annual payout, Buffett's Buffett's company is netting almost a 57% yield on cost. 57%. Now, keep in mind, that's his entire cost basis. He's got a lot of shares that he paid a lot less than $3.24. So I would bet you Warren Buffett probably has some shares that he's making 100% yield cost on. That's insane. (laughs) That's insane. Imagine every year you have some shares that you're, you're basically getting paid back your entire lump sum. Like, that's just ridiculous, man. That's ridiculous. That's the, that's the power of compounding in time, compounding in time. Put another way, Coca-Cola's dividend income alone is more than doubling Berkshire's initial investment in the company every two years. Insane, folks. So here's what I want you to do. Every single time you ever go to the refrigerator and reach for a Coca-Cola-related product or you have some sporting event and you see Coca-Cola signage or the movies or wherever, a restaurant, okay, just remember when you go to drink that Coca-Cola or you see that Coca-Cola logo, remember Warren Buffett has shares that he's probably making about 100% dividend yield on right now, which is just absolutely monumentally crazy, folks. The power of compounding, I mean, it was a game changer for me. When I learned about that in college, which is sad I had to wait to college to learn about that, uh, you know, kids should be taught that, honestly, in middle school and high school, I get to change my life forever in terms of, like, really understanding how this game really works, right? No. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about small caps, then we'll talk about, and I'll show you the data around how the stock market could likely perform in 2024, okay? So these small caps are rolling heavy. I I pulled up my best performing stocks today. Guess what? They're all little guys. Fubo, up nearly 5% here a day. Honest, up 3.8%. Honest just cracked $3 again. Um, Revolve, almost a 4% move here a day. Elf on a Shelf, which is technically not a small cap anymore. It's now technically a mid cap. It still kind of gets grouped into the small caps a little bit, even though it is a mid cap now. That one was up 3.2%. Elf starting to get, Elf, I'm wondering, don't be surprised if Elf gets an S&P 500 next year or the year after. Don't be surprised. I mean, it, it, the, the, the market cap has climbed so much, and if it keeps climbing, I mean, they got everything else to, to get an S&P 500 in the next year or two, so don't be surprised if that happens. Cheesecake Factory, a 3% plus mover, right? The smalls are rolling heavy, and it's crazy because these stocks all went from the weakest of the week to now they're the strongest of the strong. And that happened just in about a six-month span. Six months ago, many of these stocks were the weakest of the weak stocks out there. And now, day after day after day, it seems like they're the strongest of the strong, right? Now, what did I tell you guys is going to happen? I told you there's going to be basically a massive convergence of the Russell versus the NASDAQ. And I said there's only two ways you get there, right? You get a stock market crash and the Russell performs much better than the other indexes or you play catch up and the Russell outperforms other indexes significantly, right? And so here we are. This is since the end of October, right? Basically, the Russell's up 23.6%. NASDAQ's up a very impressive 18.9%. The Dow Jones is up 15.9%, which is phenomenal as well. And the S&P 500 is up 15.8%, right? That's obviously a lot of that's excitement about the Fed being done, right? And inflation being done. But look at very recently. I mean, you know, these babies are all kind of moving together for a little bit up until the past week or two. In the past week or so, then the Russell has just gone complete to another another level, right? Check this out. This is a five-year chart for these versus e- each other, right? And I tell you guys, like, there's so much there's so much catch up the Russell's gonna have to do here, folks. So much catching up to do. Okay, this is a five-year for these guys, right? 
And by the way, if I pulled up a three-year, it's even more catch-up to do. The Russell's up 56% in the past five years. Dow's up 67%. S&P 500 up 97%. And the Nasdaq's up 136%. Now, the Russell should not outperform the Nasdaq over a five-year span. Usually, the Nasdaq's going to be the best performing. But it should be somewhere better than the Dow and potentially better than the S&P 500. But that's kind of, you know, somewhere in there roughly. So this baby, the, the thing you got to understand is when it comes to small caps, like, it's still got so much catching up to do, like a lot of catching up to do. And do remember, we are now in small cap season. Small cap season in terms of outperformance, it usually happens from December to about April. And so we are now in small cap season. So if small caps continue to run heavy over this next four months, don't be surprised. It would just be seasonal pattern flows. But it's seasonal pattern flows with a little juice on top, right? Because you have a lot of people starting to position into small caps because they understand, like, the risk-reward there is, you know, the most attractive we've probably seen in the past 20 years in regards to the Russell small cap stocks. And that gets into what Tom Lee's talking about, right? Tom Lee saying, you know, 50% rise in small caps over the next 12 months, right? I'm not that bullish on smalls. But, dude, if he's right, if he's right on that, I mean, it would actually make sense. Because here's the thing. Let's imagine the Nasdaq's up 10% next year or 12% or something like that. And the, you know, the SP 500's up 8% or something and the Dow's up 8%, whatever, right? If the Russell rolled like 50%, 40, let's just call 40 to 50%, guess what? Next thing you know, on a five-year basis, it's right where it should be. It wouldn't even be like it, well, it jumped everything. It would just be right where it should be. So think about that for a moment, right? It would be right where it should be. Very intriguing. Now, if what Tom Lee says is correct, this is the stock prices these stocks are going to likely over the next 12 months, if he's correct, if he's actually accurate and those babies do go, you know, Russell hits 3000 Fubo would likely be 9 to $12 at this time next year. Honest would likely be 9 to $15 at this time next year. Revol Revolve stock would be $35 plus at this time next year. Elf on a Shelf would be $200 plus at this time next year. And Cheesecake Factory stock would be $50 plus, which that one's not usually a very volatile stock, but that would be $50 plus, if he's correct. If he's correct about Russell 3000 those are the prices we'll be seeing at this time next year. Like I said, I'm not that bullish. <laughs> I'm, I'm much... I'm a little more conservative than, than a Tom Lee. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a good year for Russell. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, you know, 15 to 25% performance, um, which would still be phenomenal for all these stocks. These would all still make huge moves. But, you know, this is a whole different level if Tom Lee's correct in regards to that, okay? Now, if you're wondering how is the stock market likely to perform, the S&P 500, in 2024, I want to show you some data that dates all the way back to 1950 and looks at what has happened over the past few years um, the couple, the past couple of years specifically, and how we're likely to perform. Okay, so check this out. This is a great tweet a, a friend sent me. It says down more than ten, uh, down, down more than ten percent like 2022, then up more than ten percent like 2023. What happens next? Safe to say, don't expect another 25 percent year, but higher all six times and add up to 11.7 percent on average is another clue. 2024 should be green for stocks. Never happened in the history since 1950 where you had a year where you had negative 10% plus, then positive 10% plus, and then that next year was negative. Never happened since 1950. So could 2024 be the first time um, that's ever happened? Sure. It's always a potential, right? Is it a very high probability? I don't think so. I don't think it's a very high probability. It's a possibility, um, but I don't think it's a super high probability, right? With that being said, by the way, I'm still going in this year hedged. I still have hedges on, just in case, just in case. By the way, if we do have any sort of tanking in the market early in the year, I'm going to likely cover a lot of those hedges. So just a little food for thought in regards to that. Um, but check this out, okay, 2024. So based upon kind of what historical trends are here, 2024 should be up, should be up, somewhere between 7.7% and 19.1% for the S&P 500. So it should be a really good year. It should be a really good year in 2024 based upon historical trends. Don't bank on it. You know, don't go all in call options or something like that because it might not happen. We might have the one freak, you know, year that all of a sudden it's down or whatever. But based upon data, and I love data like this that looks back at, you know, decades and decades of history and kind of tells you like what's likely to happen, right? We're likely going to have a green year next year. It's likely going to be a good year overall for the stock market. Um, maybe not a beast year, but it should be a good year. 
And I'm not expecting a beast year. I think it's very unrealistic to expect a beast year next year. Beast year meaning a 25%. Uh, or you know, like even even over a even over a fifteen percent, I think is a stretch for the S and P five hundred for next year, folks. So, uh, yeah, a little food for thought in regards to that. Okay, hope you enjoyed that there. Okay, alrighty, guys. Uh, over the weekend, I put together an entire like forty five minute video, roughly, that goes all into detail on how I'm planning to invest in twenty twenty four. It talks about stocks, it talks about my real estate portfolios, talks about all those sorts of things. Um, obviously, so many different divergence of opinions. It looks like 300 plus of you guys have taken advantage of that uh, free free video already. So if you want to access that, pin comment down there. I can email it over to you tonight or tomorrow. And uh, yeah, man, it's just, I mean, there's so many different opinions on recession, no recession, hard landing, soft landing. Fed's going to raise rates, lower rates, keep rates the same. Um, you know, a million different opinions. And so I thought, let me, let me talk about my plan in detail. Okay. Appreciate y'all being here. Much love as always. And uh, have a great day.